to introduce uh, our final speaker in the program, uh, Ben Griffin, who has been deployed to war not just in Afghanistan, not just in Iraq, but in Northern Ireland and Macedonia, uh, a member of the Parachute Regiment, and then finally a member of the British SAS, or the, our version of the, or like the Special Forces of the US. Uh, while he was deployed to Iraq as a SAS member, uh, he went home on leave and did what everyone should do when they go home on leave and stayed on leave permanently and did not go back. Uh, another great example of, of what's possible and what potential is there uh, by the work that we're able to do here at home. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Ben Griffin. Can you hear me all right? I, I, I really don't like microphones, so unless anyone's got a great... Use the mic. You, you sure? All right, you can't hear? Okay. If you really want me to, but I'm, I'll always forget to speak into it. Right. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own story, and then I'm going to talk about the work uh, that we've been up to with Veterans for Peace in the UK. Um, I grew up in the sort of late 70s and the 80s in what you could call a military family. My me, uh, me granddad was this big hero in the family. He was a World War II veteran, a bit like Jim. Uh, he joined the Navy at a young age, and uh, he had a load of medals, and he, he'd actually stayed in the Navy right until the 1960s. And uh, all my uncles and all my, my cousins, they were all in the Army and the Navy. And I remember as a young boy, one of my main uh, sort of uh, pastimes was trying to convince my granddad to get his medals out. And it never occurred to me at the time uh, that he kept these medals stuffed into an envelope, stuffed into a drawer. Uh, I never saw him wear them, um, but all of us, like my brother, my cousins, we're all always badgering him. Oh, Granddad, show us your medals. Tell us the stories about the Second World War. And um, from there, you know, I went on to watch all those Sunday war films that we all must have watched at one point or another, you know, about the Second World War. Read all these comic books, Commando Comics, Victor Comics, and, um, and all of these uh, different forms of media uh, told my young mind that um, the British and the Americans were the good guys, we were the noble side, that we went to war for the right reasons, and the others, the Germans and the Japanese, they were the bad people. They were the people who bayoneted prisoners, they were the people who gassed the Jews. So we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. Pretty simple way of looking at things, really appealed to a young mind. I started to read a lot of military history, and uh, I, I suppose you could say that my imagination was captured by the military at a very young age. You know, this idea, I had this idea that soldiering was the, was the, uh, the best way to serve your country, the best way to serve your society, and that actually soldiering was the only experience, the only career that actually meant anything. Everything else was secondary to this. Uh, when I was 13, I joined a military youth organisation called the Army Cadet Force, uh, which, is, which runs in the United Kingdom. You can join when you're 13. It's funded by the, the, mini, uh, by the military. And uh, as soon as you join, you get a uniform. You get taught how, how to march up and down. You get taught how to use weapons. Uh, you get to go on these camps, these army camps, where there's real soldiers there. And it's all really exciting. And uh, you're allowed to swear. You're allowed to smoke. Uh, you get to drink alcohol. And this is all pretty attractive to 13 and 14 year old boys, you know. And uh, compared to school, which is obviously quite academic, you know, learn this and then write about it, uh, the Army Cadet Force is a way you could prove yourself through physical prowess. And I really enjoyed that, you know, um, following the orders, you know, marching up and down, stripping the weapons, all this kind of stuff really appealed to me. So from growing up in a military family where my sort of imagination was captured by this, and then being in the Army Cadet Force, where I got a sort of physical attraction to the military. You know, I really like being cold and wet and not having much food and carrying these weights and following these orders. It kind of appealed to me, my brain. By the time I left school, um, I decided that I wanted to be a paratrooper. I went to the recruiting office. I walked straight in there. I said, I want to be a paratrooper. He goes, well, do you not want to hear about the other parts of the Army? I was like, no, no, this is what I want to do. I didn't ask what the pay was. I didn't ask how much holiday I would get. I didn't ask how long I'd have to sign up for when I signed that paperwork. That's how much I wanted to be in there. So I turned up in basic training in a room not much bigger than this. 
and an old captain comes out the front. He says, there's 35 of you sat in this room. Eight of you will be here in six months' time. And he was right. There were only eight of us at the end of that course. It was a brutal, a brutal sort of training regime. And um, people often ask me, you know, you're, a, you're all volunteers. Why did, you, why did you stick around? Well, all, all the eight of us who passed, we, we all wanted to be paratroopers. Um, we wanted to be in that gang. For some reason, as a 19-year-old, it, it seemed to be of great importance to, to be in that gang, to, be, to have that uniform, to wear that beret, you know, uh, to be a paratrooper. And at the same time, the screws, the, the people who were training us, they took advantage of our desire um, to instill in us um, several things. For a start, the eight of us who passed, uh, all of us would follow orders without question. Uh, I often go into schools, and one of the things I do with the kids in the schools, I say, you, stand up. Come on, stand up. Get out of your chair. Stand up. Now, you see, you won't do it. This is a good thing. <laughs> the next part is, all right, I want you to take your clothes off and run around the building naked. Uh, and obviously, none of these kids would do that. It'd be quite disturbing if they did. And obviously, this gentleman here didn't even, didn't even flinch, didn't even stand up. By the end of our training, all of us would have been naked running around the room. You know, we'd have done exactly as we were told. So they'd instilled in us... Um, that we should follow orders without question. Um, they'd also instilled in us that we should uh, kill uh, without question. So one of our greatest desires after the six months of training was to go to war and kill the enemy. No matter who that enemy was, that was what we wanted to do, you know. Uh, so they instilled that into us. And the other thing they'd instilled into us was a loyalty to the gang. Um, the parachute regiment meant everything to us. We had no loyalty to society, we had no loyalty to our families, we had no loyalty to the law. Our only loyalty was to this regiment. And the way they had done that was um, they, they encouraged us to hate. They encouraged us to hate everybody in the army who wasn't in the parachute regiment. We were taught to call them crap hats because they didn't have the same hat that we had. They had crap hats. And we were also taught to hate the Navy, taught to hate the RAF. But in a more sinister way, you know, you often hear that the military, you know, whether it's in the UK or the US, they're here to protect us. But the people we were taught to despise the most were our own civilians, society back home. We were taught to call them civvy cunts. Um, these were the lowest of the low, people who couldn't join the military, had no desire to join the military. We were taught to hate these people, despise them. And I think the reason for that was is that if you can train young men to despise the society they come from, despise the civilians in their own society, how are they going to behave to civilians from another society? And I think that's where that was coming from. Um, I served in the parachute regiment for six years. I deployed to Northern Ireland three times. I deployed to Yugoslavia, Afghanistan. And um, I was within this cult of the parachute regiment where the only thing, of anything in, of, the only thing that it mattered to us was our status within that unit. So nothing else mattered. And um, after six years, I uh, applied and was successful to join the special operations in, in the UK. And it was in 2005, really, where my sort of military service started to fall apart. Uh, and that was when I was deployed to Iraq. I was deployed to, to Baghdad in 2005 um, into an American military unit. Uh, it's now called JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. At the time, I, we, were called, we had some obscure name. I think we were Task Force 623 or something like that. They change the name of these things all the time. Um, so most of the British military was down in Basra, and we'd been placed into this American unit. And we were told that our job in Iraq was to capture high-value targets. And these were supposedly people involved in the insurgency. Uh, this is 2005, so the... You know, the, the resistance to the occupation had heated up by that time. Uh, these were supposedly people who were part of that resistance. And they were our, considered our enemy, and we were supposed to hunt these people down and capture them. <coughs> and I want to talk a little bit about that process, because Jim mentioned earlier about, um, you know, if you'd have spoken to a, uh, an American, on, on the, you know, just before he went into D-Day and talked about how American society has now become, you know, how he'd be spinning in his grave. And I think it's important that we... Uh, recognize the similarities in our societies, both the UK and the US, with, with Nazi Germany, you know, and people say, we, didn't, we don't gas Jews, you know, that, that's the thing they always say, we're not Nazis, we don't gas Jews, but we do a lot of what the Nazis used to do. And one of the main things we use, one of the main processes we use, is something called, that I call uh, compartmentalization. And that's when you take a big 
plan, a big job, and you split it up into lots of easy jobs, small little jobs. And everyone is doing these little jobs, but no one knows what anyone else is doing, except for the people at the top. And if we use the, the Nazis as an analogy here, and we think about the genocide on the Jews, it's a French policeman who goes into the French Jew's house and drags him out and his family out of the house. He puts him on a truck. Another guy drives that truck to the train station. Someone else drives the train across the border. Then maybe a German guy gets in the train. He drives the train to the Polish border. Then maybe a Polish guy gets in and drives the train. Then someone else drags the Jews off the train, shaves their heads, put them in the stripy pajamas, and puts them to work. And someone else guards them while they're working for months on end, not being fed, until they become skinny and their heads are, you know, their hair's falling out maybe and they've got rashes and things and they start to smell because they haven't washed. And by the time they, these people get to the gas chamber, the person who puts them in the gas chamber, they're not seeing the French person who was pulled out of their house a year ago, six months ago. They're seeing someone who's been dehumanized. And so it's a lot easier for that person at the end of the chain to do that, to put that person into the gas chamber. But I, I reckon that if someone had to do all of those jobs, you know, starting from taking a person out of the house in Paris all the way through, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. You'd become attached to that person. And we're running a similar thing. We're running a similar thing. And when I was in Iraq, we were running a similar thing. Because what would happen is we'd have uh, intelligence services. That was the start of the chain. And they made it known to the people in Iraq that we were paying money for intelligence. We want to know who the bad guys are. And people would come and give them intelligence. Why? Because at the time, high unemployment, not a lot of money going along, things were scarce, people would do anything for money. So people would go in, speak to the intelligence services, give them names and addresses. Those names and addresses would then get passed on to the surveillance teams. And the surveillance teams, having been told by their friends in the intelligence services that these people were bad people, would start to follow these people around. Now, if you've been told that Mr. Smith living on Westmoreland Avenue is a terrorist, and you've been told to follow him around, well, everything that Mr. Smith starts to do, you start to find suspicious. So if Mr. Smith starts to dig in his garden, you don't think, oh, he must be doing his vegetables. You think, what's he hiding in the garden? If Mr. Smith comes out of his house with a bag, puts it in the boot, and drives somewhere else, you're not thinking, oh, he's taking something around to his mother's house. You're thinking, that must be a weapon. And when he goes to these other houses, you're not thinking, oh, this is his friends and family. You're thinking, this is a terrorist network. And before you know it, you've built up this huge picture of Mr. Smith, everyone Mr. Smith knows, everywhere Mr. Smith goes, and you've got this picture in your head about who he is and what he's doing. And eventually, once you've built up that picture, the job was passed on to my team. And we were what you, you know, what in some books have been called the kill or capture team. We were the guys who went out in the night and picked these people up. And um, I just want to describe to you one of those jobs, trying to get this across, because I don't think, I think sometimes it's, it's difficult to, back here to realise actually what our soldiers are doing abroad. So I just want you to kind of uh, relax, maybe, uh, you know, close your eyes if you want to. I'm just going to try and describe a job. So I want you to imagine now that it's midnight and you're in your own home in Los Angeles. It's dark. You're in bed. Your family are asleep in the, in the other rooms. Okay, so it's nice and dark, it's nice and quiet. Everything's peaceful. And whilst you're asleep, 25 armed men, uh, we've got shotguns, assault rifles, grenades, explosives. We're creeping up to your house. You don't even know we're there. We're creeping up the side of your house and we're creeping up to your front door and we're putting a huge amount of explosives on your front door. You're still asleep. The first thing you know about us coming in is bang. The explosives go off on your front door. There's dust everywhere. Your ears are ringing. It's still dark. And before you can realize what's going on, you know, it's like the biggest firework you've ever heard has just gone off in your house. You can hear men in your house, downstairs. You can hear these men, they're coming in. They're coming up the stairs. You can hear them in the rooms downstairs. Heavy footsteps coming up the stairs, kicking your door in. Maybe they're throwing a, a minor explosive in on the way in. They've got you. They're dragging you out of your bed. All the males, you're being dragged downstairs into one room. Females into another room. 
children into another room. You're all being held at gunpoint. The males are taken into a room and brutally interrogated. Slapped around, punched around, shouted at in a foreign language they can't understand. The women and children are held at gunpoint in another room. And my job at this point was to go around your house with a big sack, like a mail sack, and take everything out of your house of any use. Bank statements, passports, mobile phones, money, any weapons you might have. And before you're thinking, oh, weapons, they must have been terrorists. Everyone in Iraq at that time had a rifle in the house. It was one of the most dangerous places on earth. There were kidnaps and ransoms going on all the time. You know, it was, it was, uh, it was a common thing for people to have rifles in their houses. So whilst we're interrogating the males, and we're talking about anyone between the ages of 16 and 65, your house is getting trashed. And we're not carefully going through your house, everything's being ripped apart. All, of, all the cupboards are getting ripped open, all the drawers, everything's getting trashed. People are crying now. Now we're filling all this stuff up, putting all the stuff in the bags. And maybe you dare to have a glimpse out of the room you're being held in. After 20 minutes, we've got everything that's in your house into these three bags. And your dad or your brother or your husband or whoever it is, he's in the hallway. We've put a black sack over his head. We put some earphones on his ears and we've tied his hands up with plastic cable ties. And we're dragging him out through the hole where your front door used to be. This has lasted about 20 minutes. And this is the job that we were doing again and again, night after night, going into people's houses, doing this job. Sometimes we'd go into a first house and the guy who was leading it all would say, we've got the wrong house, it's next door. And we'd stack up again and do the same, same job again, again and again. Most of the time, the people we took back with us were not the people we were looking for. We'd have a name and a photograph on our arms. We're after this person here, Mr. Smith. But this guy's Mr. Davis. Doesn't matter, he's in this address. This is a known address he's coming to. We'd take these people back to our base, line them up against the wall, and go for some breakfast. Another team would then come out and take these people into the initial interrogation cells where they'd be interrogated uh, for sort of like information. And then after that, they would get assessed again about what sort of value we placed on them, whether they were of a high value or a low value, and that would decide which prison they went to. Now, if they went to, uh, who's heard of Abu Ghraib? Okay, so they go to Abu Ghraib. That was one of the better prisons. <laughs> that was one of the better ones. So you might get uh, mucked around by the prison guards there, National Guard people, maybe, you know, stacking you up naked, getting you to do outrageous sexual acts and photographing it. If you went to one of the black sites, Camp Nama at Baghdad International Airport, Camp Balad, you were going to meet some pretty nasty people. The, uh, the interrogation team that worked at Camp Nama had a, had, a, had a motto, and it was no blood, no foul. And that meant as long as they didn't make these people bleed, they were okay. They could get away with it. They carried out outrageous tortures going on in this, uh, these centres. I've actually spoke to one of the guys who, who was there. Uh, he was an RAF soldier. Uh, he was a, a refueler, and his job was to guard the prison camp, the outside of the prison camp. And they were told, whilst you're guarding this prison camp, not to ever turn round and look at what's going on. You're to face outwards. Don't turn round. It's nothing to do with you. And a couple of times, he said, have you seen what's going on? Don't, don't look, don't look, his mate would say. Don't look what's going on. We don't need to know this. These people were held in dog kennels in the sun and dragged out and, ha and had brutal interrogations carried out by, uh, it, I'm sad to say, uh, by American interrogators. But we were complicit too because our officers would then go to those interrogations and feed questions in and listen to the answers and base our future operations on the stuff that came out of these torture operations. And that's what we used to do. Night after night, we used to carry out these operations. But these operations had a, took a toll on me um, because this, my preconceived ideas about what a British soldier was, about what the British Army was about, were based on the propaganda that I'd been brought up on. We were the good guys, yeah? We were the people who liberated the Nazi death camps. We were the people who fought the Japanese, these evil soldiers who tortured their prisoners of war. And wait a minute, what am I doing? This, this sounds like what the Nazis used to do. And... Uh, Going into these houses night after night and 
I think it was the uh, one of the things that had a big effect to me was the looks that we were getting, like when the families were looking at you, like the kids looking at you and the wives looking at you and the, and the husbands looking at you. And it was the look, you, I still remember it now, you know, it's just like, it's kind of a look of disbelief, you know, what are you doing? Just, and it had a major effect on me doing this night after night. And um, I started to doubt what we were doing, started to question internally what we were doing. But at the same time, I was within this military family that had been my life for the last eight years and um, found it difficult to open conversations with people about what we were doing. I just used to get angry about it, you know. What the fuck's all this about? Why are we doing this? You know, but I couldn't sort of like articulate fully with these comrades of mine my uh, issues with what was going on. But it all came to a head because our commanding officer came out to see us. And uh, we were sat in a room like this, and he was giving us a briefing on the war in Iraq. This is 2005. And I'll never forget his words halfway through that briefing when he said to me, or well, said to all of us, but I felt he was talking directly to me. And he said, I'm worried that we're becoming the secret police of Baghdad. And I thought, did he just say that? Did he really just say that? And he did. And I started to think a bit more about where we were, you know. And it turns out that we were living in villas on the River Tigris within Baghdad that Saddam, Hussein, Saddam Hussein's henchmen used to live in. And we were using prisons that Saddam Hussein used to use. And I'm pretty sure that we were going after people that Saddam Hussein used to go after. These are troublemakers, you know, people who stick their necks out. By the time I got sent home on leave and a lot of other stuff, I haven't got time to, to, to tell you all about it. You know, there's a lot, a lot of other stuff going on in Iraq at the time that I was sort of witness to. Um, it got to the point where every day I was kind of thinking about this going, I can't do this anymore, you know. I know this is wrong. I know what I'm doing is wrong. I know what's happening to these people are wrong. Um, and I can't do this. And every day I'd go through this kind of like turmoil thinking about this and thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And it got to the point where I realised I couldn't go back. And at first I, I thought, right, I'm just going to do a runner. I'm going to buy a plane ticket somewhere and fly off. And it, I, I had this idea for maybe a day and then I thought, you know, no, I can't do this, I can't do this, you know. I'm going to have to write a letter. So I wrote this letter to my CO about why I wasn't going to go back to Iraq. And I was reading this letter, kept on rereading it. I thought, I can't do this either. I'm going to have to go and see him. So I walked into the base. And I went into the admin office, the, the regimental HQ, and I said, uh, I need to speak to the CO. And the clerk said to me, is this about leaving the army? <laughs> and I was like, shit, is he reading my mind? You know, is that... <laughs> I said, I need to speak to the CO. He says, okay, come back this afternoon. So I've gone in there and I was terrified. If you've ever been in trouble at school and you've been sent to the headmaster, it was like that, but like times a hundred, you know. So I thought, I've got to keep this simple, because I, I just got to keep this very simple and stick to what I'm saying, you know, stick to my guns here, because I just didn't know what was going to happen. So I just went in there. He said, Griffin, what's all this about? I said, look, sir, um, I don't agree with the war in Iraq anymore. I don't agree with what we're doing, and I'm, I'm not going to work under American command anymore. All right. And I kind of <laughs> put this on the table. I kind of put this on the table, and there was a pause. And I was kind of waiting for the reaction, not knowing what this reaction was going to be. I'd already told my girlfriend, look, I'm probably not coming home tonight. I think I'm going to end up in the cells, you know. And he says, OK, OK, uh, you go home. We'll have a think about this. Come back tomorrow. And uh, I was kind of looking at him kind of suspiciously thinking, is there going to be a trap door opening? You know, are they going to sort of let the dogs out once I've left the building? But uh, that started a process then. And to be fair to my regiment, they, they treated me perfectly. Um, I had to go through about five interviews where they were uh, in-depth interviews where they were sort of like investigating what this was all about and my reasons for leaving. And they decided that this was genuine, you know, that right. I, I had a sort of like a moral objection to what was going on in Iraq. There was one officer, though, who was highly critical of me, and that was the Padre. In, in the British Army, we call the chaplains the Padre. Uh, he, he was the worst one. He, he, he said to me, you know, Griffin, I was down in the Falklands war and on the boat down to the Falklands we had people like you scared scared of going in there and I was trying to explain to him that I wasn't scared of doing this job and in fact there wasn't much for, much for us to be scared about 
If you're sneaking up into someone's house in the middle of the night and using explosives on the house and charging in there all 25 of you, no one puts up a fight. You know, the people who had to be scared were the people we were coming for, you know? And he couldn't get this, you know? But um, it's quite telling that in the British Army, the, the Padres have a cat badge and it says, through God conquer. Uh, it's, it's not very Christian, I don't think, anyway. But. Anyway, so it turned out I was discharged from the army. I was a career soldier. I thought I was going to be in the army for 22 years. I'm out. I don't know what I'm, I'm going to do. Um, I'm quite relieved that I'm not going back to Iraq. Um, but straight away, I'm kind of uh, separated from the family, you know, like of all the people I'd been with for the last eight years. But um, things moved on quite quickly because one of the things that really started to bother me was uh, watching the media and seeing the politicians speaking, seeing the generals speaking, seeing the media speaking. And they were talking about Iraq, and it bare no resemblance, bore no resemblance <laughs> to my own experiences. You know, they were talking about winning the hearts and minds of people. They were talking about schools for girls. They were talk uh, talking about all sorts of nonsense, you know, how the security situation was, was getting better and all this kind of stuff. And it really made me angry, and I decided that I had a duty, uh, an obligation to tell people about my own experiences in, in the hope you know, that, um, that people would realise what was really going on and that this would somehow change things, uh, you know, and that maybe people would start to question more what was going on in Iraq. Um, so I started to speak in public, I started to speak at anti-war movements. I, uh, I met uh, Cindy Sheehan in 2005 and Kelly Doherty from Veterans for Peace. Um, and this kind of went on for a while and it, this is a whole long story, I'm not going to sort of bore you with, but uh, it ended up, I, I was, uh, the government took me to the, the Royal Courts of Justice, which is like the biggest court in, in Britain, and uh, in a secret trial uh, gave me a lifetime injunction, which means that I cannot tell you anything I know as a result of my service in Special Forces. <laughs> and uh, I've been following that diligently ever since. 